hold on so much. Doesn't even ask people. That's fun. Oh, maybe it did. Anyway, um, okay, so let's see. Hi, I'm Chris. Um, I went to school at a um a place named Purchase College, which is right um about 20 miles north of New York City. Um, uh, a state school. My parents told me, well, I got into some private schools in New York, and my parents were like, if you go to private school, you will pay. And if you go to a state school, we will help you a lot. Uh, so I chose state school, but I also it was the, it felt like the right, um, for me, it was the right fit just because the, the private schools had me visiting offices where I was talking to people that weren't artists and they were just trying to like, uh, it didn't feel natural. And the purchase was a place where I talked to an artist who told, gave me some advice and like, it was, it was an open experience and I loved it. So I, it, middle of a snowiest day ever, my mom drove me up there and I went to school there. And as soon as I got there, I was um, introduced to well, um, the first, you're not in, it was like a conservatory program. So you um, are not allowed to take photo until the second semester. And I was very annoyed by that, but it was good. It was good to have like a, a kind of base in sculpture and design. It helped me out a lot later. Um, I remember my first photo class uh, was a photojournalism class because I got to, I had got to sneak into it because it wasn't a photo major class, all this college crap. But in that um, in that class, I learned I, I, it was a black professor, pretty much the only black professor in the school, and he was um, teaching about uh, Gordon Park's work, which I've never seen before. That because I mean I because I was seventeen years old, pretty much going to college, uh, so I was very interested early in like Gordon Park's and documentary like photography work. Oh my god, what's going on here? What are these dots? What's that? Okay, okay. Can we see the uh, things are changing on screens? Everybody can see this. Cool. And also, of course, Eugene Smith. So these people were my kind of idols as soon as I started in photography a little later in college I was interested in like more urban landscape work and this is a photo photograph by a guy named George Tice um, then slightly more conceptual uh, Sugimoto and his theater series where he left the camera open for full movies and kind of took these like 810 I think 810 view camera work somebody can tell me I'm wrong if they're not 810 but I think they're 810 um, and then I started to get really interested in like four or five imagery, which is, um, or uh, large format. Um, I remember buying, a, I had a 35 already, and then I bought a medium format from a guy. And then I had a non uh, four or five class about a month later. And then I sold that medium format to get a, nine, a four or five, which was the best thing I ever did. I mean, I love that. I love it. Uh, and then really late, like when, when I was graduating college, these guys were showing a lot like Thomas Struth. And this is Andre Skursky, of course. So I saw this print. I think at the MoMA or one of the prints like this at like 120 inches wide. And it kind of opened my mind up to, you know, just kind of the cap the possibilities of photography. Um, then I just started to make photographs. So in school, I was making weird studio portraits, which come back a lot later. I was just like kind of experimenting here, of course. Um, these are some messy ass snakes. Uh, and early on, because my parents were helping me pay for college, I needed to make more money immediately. Like, I mean, immediately so because film all that because it was film i mean i was in a program of course in 2000 there was no digital yet there was digital printing but there was no digital photography that was any good so i learned on film and was shooting dance performances and actor portraits this is a dance portrait i would uh go into um and this is for money of course not a lot of money and i probably lost money actually thinking about like how much film costs and developing all the stuff and all the time and then getting paid a hundred dollars for a job where I photographed like four rolls of anyway, uh, I but it it taught me it, I um it taught me how to be uh, a worker. It taught me how to make money in photograph uh, photography, I'm, and how to um deal with situations that are not normal. Like I mean, I remember photographing picture like this on a medium format camera, manual medium format camera on a tripod with like a kind of I'm swiveling the head in the dark. I I'm pushing eight hundred black and white film to thirty two hundred and then pushing it in the dark room again to try to like get, get something on the negative. So I was very happy with myself with pictures like that. But I also photographed uh, people's um, dance performance or um, this is a theater performance. So this is a poster for the for the performance. Um, yeah, Purchase is a conservatory school. So it was like uh, dancing, uh, acting, music and uh, and uh, theater. So I had a lot of people to photograph. So it kept me going. I mean, I've always had another job like we're like um, 
uh, Hamida and I were just talking about hustle, the hustle. And, you know, I learned that from my parents um, immediately, I mean, like immediately, because it was all hustle in our house. Like my, my dad um, didn't go to college and went straight into like construction with his father. And then after that kind of, well, when he was young, he remembers um, Star Trek coming out and he remembered these remotes they used and that didn't exist then. There was no remote controls really. So he kind of learned how to build a remote and started making these like um, 12 inch square remotes out of corm or or uh, or uh, marble that he'd cut out the center of and then put a remote inside that would controlled everything in the house like the blinds uh the tv of course the fridges air conditioners everything that could be connected to that he figured out how to do he had him and he did this all in our basement so that was kind of his business and he still has that business going now which is now i think well i'm 40 so 35 years later he still has that going and my mom is a, a, a saleswoman she sells medical um she sells digit digitization of medical records departments in the northeast so that's kind of they're just hustling and on the road and doing their thing so i learned that pretty early on uh when i got out of college i moved back to queens where i'm from um what's going on uh yeah Every time someone's let in, it messes up my fleet. Okay, cool. Here we go. Went back to Queens and started making landscape, uh, landscape architecture, photography, and focusing on pieces that I thought would not be around very long. I mean, it seemed like everything I was photographing was um, becoming gone really quickly. So I biked around Queens for years, photographing everything I could um, to capture that time. Um, which is good now because I look back and nothing's the same. So I sometimes go back and take pictures like this one for sure. I've taken this. You can't even see this anymore. It's just the weeds. All these weeds have grown into 40 foot trees at this point. So you can't even see the city from this location. Um, all this has changed. I now live in this neighborhood in Long Island City. So I've been photographing it for about 16 or 17 years. Um, they actually moved this Pepsi sign. So this, yeah, this Pepsi Cola sign is somewhere here. They moved it and they moved it like... I think 30 feet to the left, which is so dumb, just to fit an apartment building there. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to go through this stuff quick because there's a lot to show. And I just wanted to show that like I, I, I focused on Long Island City and Queens for a lot of um, the landscape work because I was just here. I was living here. So I was always photographing here. This little, this tiny guy is like 14 or 15 stories and there's now a building that wraps around this clock tower and is 70 stories or 60 stories high. It's kind of unbelievable. You can't see it from this view because there's a building there too. Um, yeah, so I was kind of photographing New York as I as I could. And over the, it's this is chronological, but kind of goes back and forth. I, I, in 2007, I started working for the Guggenheim Museum, photographing the collection. Uh, so I was responsible for, you know, doing, this is a catalog cover um, for a Giacometti catalog that was made like maybe six or seven years ago. I remember the front of the, if you ever see this Giacometti cover, um, they turned it backwards because they couldn't fit it correctly, full, like to the right, pointing to the right. So they actually turned it backwards and put it on the cover of a book, which I thought was like, what the fuck, man? Like, how can you do that? Anyway, so the, you know, I, I, I swiftly stopped working for the Guggenheim after like things like this kept happening. Um, but it gave me a lot of opportunity to see great work and really terrible work at the same time and kind of learn how a museum works as well. Uh, yeah, Modigliani. Uh, this dude's name is uh, Maurizio Catalan. He put this golden, a solid golden toilet in the Guggenheim Museum, which was a spectacle for about a year. I'm so glad I got this like tote bag. I think I have two of them, which is just a sky blue tote bag with this stupid ass toilet on it. Um, I was also responsible to make portraits at the Guggenheim, like staff portraits, exhibition photography, um, installation, uh, like working with art handlers to see how things were installed, especially all these kind of uh, 70s, 60s, 70s. Um, I forgot this time. I forgot what, like what the, um, what kind of art this is considered. I think it was like Donald Judd or something, but what was that? What is that? What is that called? What is this art form? Like, what is this art called? Like what was this series or like impression? It's not impression. It's like, anyway, it doesn't matter. But I learned a lot as we went on. Um, I was at the museum a lot of late nights photographing um, parties and stuff like that. Uh, that became a, this became like a subway ad. This was in a magazine and 
they install these cars starting at like 9 p.m. every night. So I would be there until like maybe one or two o'clock in the morning photographing. You can't see here, but there's a guy in like the fourth car up installing these lights while it hangs in the middle of the museum. Um, it's kind of wild. I mean, that top car is probably 60 feet off the ground. Um, art handlers are pretty much geniuses. Uh, so treat them well. Um, this guy turned off all the music. Fuck- I don't like this artist. So I don't name him, but like this guy turned off the museum uh, lights and uh, let- gave everybody a headlamp so they could walk around and see the art in the dark. This guy put a hundred thousand dollars on the wall in singles, got sued because somebody did it before he did it. And at the same time as all that stuff's happening um, in 2009, I opened up a gallery named Chris Graves projects. Um, and we, we did uh, solo shows, uh, works on paper and photography exhibits in Brooklyn, New York, in Dumbo specifically for about two and a half years from 2009 to 11. We got a cheap space. Um, we got a cheap space because the economy just crashed in 2008. And by 2009, these places, I mean, we rented out this gallery space for, I think, $1,000 a month for two, three years or something like that. So it was kind of a steal. And it, it allowed me and my cousin to kind of run a program we wanted to run with photographers we wanted to work with and, you know, like no external kind of uh, say in what we were doing in the space. So we we did what we wanted. And that was like that felt really good. And um, and yeah, we had a lot of shows. We showed a lot of art and we sold some of it. I mean, <laughs> we sold probably enough every show to keep this shit going. But like, really, we weren't gallerists. I was still working full time for the Guggenheim. I worked there from 2007 to 2018. So I was working full time while I ran this gallery um, on the weekends and, of course, Thursday and Friday nights and stuff like that. So it was busy times. I also lived probably an hour and a half from the gallery. So I would like commute in three times a week from anyway. It was a lot. But we've photographed and showed a lot of work that we uh, were really happy with. At the same time as that's happening, I'm thinking about publishing and like how to get work into people's homes. I realized that having the gallery open, working in the gallery was cool, but. I didn't know rich people and I couldn't really sell this to the people I knew. So um, it, I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to cold call rich people that I don't really know to try to get them to buy anything. So I rather have, I rather flip it around um, and say like, well, if it's $40 and you don't want it, then you just don't want it. That's fine. But if you do want it now, I'm giving you an, an opportunity to get art for this price. Right. So I switched, I flipped my company to publishing and we started with, a book that was so expensive that it didn't make any sense. Um, this is a book named <laughs> Guardians of Solitude by a photographer named Laura McPhee. And it's pretty much 16 by 20 inches and 16 by 40 inches opened. So what I ha- what I did is I pretty much went to Strand Bookstore and all, all the bookstores in New York City, looked at every single photo book that, was, that I wanted to and found the presses for each one, called them all and asked if they can even make a book that was 1620. I think 90% said no, and two people probably said yes. And then we went with one of the people that said yes. Made our first book, uh, very short. I think it's 48 pages, but really big. Shit cost about probably 60 grand that I didn't have to come out of pocket for, so that was fun. I don't even know if they ever got the full payment for these books to press, uh, but I wasn't responsible for it. I'm just responsible for like editing the book. So it was like a happy medium for me. Unfortunately, I then had to store, a, like I still store them, some of them, so... I guess I'm still paying for it. Anyhow, um, after that, I wanted to make smaller books. Uh, (laughs) So the first book I made was this little tiny eight by 10 inch book um, of my own work. uh, Well, a collaboration between me and a friend named Eric Harabedian, who's a portrait photographer. I did landscapes and it was called A Queen's Affair. Um, And that was just a little book to see if we can make something that $40 people would buy. I think we sold not enough of them. And the second one, uh, this is when Kickstarter was pretty um, popular. I did a book named Permanence, which is this. And it was... Pretty much eight years or nine years of travels, visiting people around the world um, and around the United States. And uh, kind of uh, the Kickstarter helped me think about how to make a bunch of sales at once within 30 days and like how to push it as far as um, as marketing and emailing people individually to get them to, to help. And it was my first book, so it worked out well, but I still didn't make the money that I needed until the last day. So it was stressful 30 days and then it worked out at the end. Um, because it worked out once, I thought it could maybe work out again. So I decided the next year to complete a book project on, on Iceland, which uh, was three, I took three trips around Iceland photographing uh, 
just off of this ring road that they have, which I think is about 1400 kilometers. And um, I wanted to make uh, images that were accessible because at that point Iceland seemed very inaccessible and all the pictures you were seeing were from the mountaintops and like looking down on beautiful scenes but I wanted to kind of photograph what was possible to see as a as a regular tourist because I it, first off you don't really see black people in Iceland and I and for a lot of my travels I didn't really run into people of color in any of these spaces that I was in um, so I wanted to make a kind of guidebook for, you know, regular people to kind of find scenes. Um, and yeah, did that uh, the next year, did another Kickstarter, made it barely again, but this was cheaper because the press made a mistake on the first book that I exploited for the second book uh, to make it like 50% cheaper, which was great. Um, but if you have any questions about this, you can ask me now or later. Um, after making my own few books to start, I decided to open it up to make books with people that um, like, uh, artists that I was familiar with and loved the projects for. So I started with a dude named Jason Hanasek who made a project named I Slowly Watched Him Disappear about a, a boy going through the junior ROTC program in Virginia Beach. They're both from there and he was photographing like him trying to fit into this kind of ultra masculine role. Made a book with uh, a dude named Luke Abiol um, named Winters Berlin. Um, Luke fell in love at first sight with a woman when I was with him in Berlin because we had cheap $400 flights round trip because we got like a thousand dollar bonus from our job that we both worked at. So we went to Berlin together with a few other friends and he fell in love with a woman, moved there for, and stayed there for seven years, raised four kids and uh, made this work. That's the woman he moved there for, Marie Loire. Um, so made this book and then a, a book uh, a poetry and photography book named Journey with Marilyn Rye. And it was a mix between, yeah, you know, poetry and photography. All of pictures are in Turkey and it was, pretty much the closest she could get to Afghanistan where she was born um, and her father was actually a missionary. That comes back later because we made the book about her father being a missionary because he was shooting 35 millimeter slides in Afghanistan pre-revolution. Um, so that's also really good. That that book turned out really well. Um, 10 years, like eight years after that. After making all the big books that cost a lot of money, I wanted to make something cheap uh, for myself. So it was like a yearbook named Provisional Scenery. Um, scenes from 2012 that I made in January, 2013, made 125 copies. I think they cost about $15 a copy to produce. And I made, you know, no money doing this, but I, but it was fun to like have a project like this of just a yearbook of sorts. And it was, and I think a lot of, I mean, some of my friends said it was the best book I ever made. I hope that's wrong, but it, but it was good. Uh, in about 2014, 15, I started, actually, um, that's when I met Hamida, I think 2013 in Houston, uh, what was that? Um, the photo reviews out there. I forgot what Photofest. Photofest. Is it Photofest? Houston? Yeah. That's what it's called? Uh-huh. Well, yeah. Met you there. Now, ten. that's 10 years, right? 10 years ago. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and uh, at that point, I started working on a project named Testament, where I was photographing um, Black... I, I mean, I did a lot of practice on this project, probably for two years of crap photographs that I usually don't show people, and then figured out this way to... Um, give people their own color, give people their own agency with lighting. So um, I I asked a bunch of my friends that were that were in, you know, just friends to sit for me. Um, I, I had three color changing LED light bulbs or one, two, three, yeah, three, three color changing light bulbs. I would sit for all the models and then we'd switch like, and then they'd look at color on me and then we'd switch and I'd photograph them in the color they chose on me for themselves. Um, we did, I did that in 2014 and made my own little book, which I, that, which I asked a, a blue sky gallery in Portland to act as my co publisher for, which pretty much meant I gave them copies and that was, that was it. I've still paid for the whole thing and made it myself, but like I put their name in it, um, just to kind of feel like, um, it was co-published. Uh, so I made that book and then added um, some content like uh, written content. There's visual content that's on YouTube. We did, it was a, it was kind of a amazing little project cause I didn't know. I mean, it was just kind of working through, working through the issues. This is around the time where a lot of people like black people were being like kind of murdered on camera by police officers. So, so yeah, this was kind of the the fight against that. Then um, that year, my wife was like, "Why did you only photograph men? Women go through the same issues, kind of." So I then photographed like 
women for this like part two of this project. This is actually my sister. And also included stories from each of the women in this book. Um, and then I co-curated that or co-published this with Bryn Mawr College, who actually paid for the whole thing and gave me 200 free copies to sell on my own. So that was cool. Very cool. I had a show there and they they kind of hooked me up. And these are I think that these are kind of just mu much stronger photographs because I instead of having a dark backdrop, I had a light one that kind of pushed all the light towards it and made everything really colorful and quite, quite beautiful, actually. Um, I've, I have shown the pictures like this a lot, like these big grids. Um, it kind of stopped last, uh, maybe two years during like COVID time. I showed it like a grid for the last time. No one asks anymore. But uh, it's always been fun for me because I photo I print these grids on like the cheapest photo paper ever. Be uh, it's called like en enhanced matte Epson paper because it's the only paper that I could find that has like a good dynamic range as well as is cheap and doesn't glare. Because usually when you have a, uh, like pictures up nine, 10 feet on the wall, you look at them from below, you're going to see the light glaring off the images. And this was like the perfect paper that has no glare. It was, it's always worked for me. Um, and the other thing is it's like, I can produce this whole wall for like a few hundred dollars because they, you know, this place in university of Arizona did not have any money to give me to come out, but I wanted to show on a 2000 square foot space because I'm in New York city and I never get this amount of space. So for me to even just go out there and be able to have the show was enough. Like I realized that making good photographs of the installation, this is not the whole show, but um, making those photographs was more valuable to me than anything else at this moment. So I went out, did it, you know, spent the money and did it. Chris, how are those adhered to the wall? They don't taped look like they're in frames. Uh, yeah, no, they're just taped in the corners and maybe the middle to the wall, blue okay. tape, blue artist tape or whatever. And then at yeah. the end of the show, I have the whoever runs the gallery rip them into pieces, show me a photograph of the ripped pile, and then they throw yep. them in the garbage. And then I, you know, that's the end of the show. That's so great. It's very, it's very simple. I mean, I imagine they'd ruin all of the prints trying to get the tape off. So I was like, you might as well just take them off. I did have a show in, uh, in, uh, Cle uh, for, oh shit, where are the, uh, the Wright brothers from? Is it? Dayton? I don't know, some part of Ohio. And um, they took off the tape and gave me back the prints and they were perfect. And I was like, damn, you guys are the best, man. Like they spent so much time. Anyway, um, around the same time, I was asked by uh, a blog that Vanity Fair ran, ran named Hive to think about a, a series of uh, Black Lives Matter kind of series about all these murders that were happening like on screen. Um, this is a book that I made way after the photo shoots, but what it was, was um, I chose to photograph eight locations where black people were killed by police officers on camera. Um, and I would just kind of walk the scenes and see what the landscapes looked like. So to me, I mean, it was a dream job that where I could photograph like just the most boring photographs on earth, but they also had this meaning. So, um, so yeah, I went around the country every weekend because I still was working at the Guggenheim at this point, photographing uh, these these kind of murder scenes pretty much um, and the kind of learning about the communities and talking to people and figuring out really that all these places are the same they're not the middle of the hood they're just places where you know people live and places where things like this happen and that's everywhere um indiscriminately could i hey chris could i i'm sorry to interrupt could i ask a question mm -hmm. um so I love this work and I show it. I, I teach some zine and small bookmaking. Oh, you're the best. Class. Is that signed? So, yeah. So I have a question for you. I, have, I speculate when I talk about this work, I talk about this work all the time. So not wrong, number one and number two, but number one is obviously important for, for a good reason. But the, the, the speculation is the, the choice of size or scale for this piece. Could you talk a little bit about that? I'm not going to, I, I tell folks what I think you did when you were choosing that size but i want the ask, printed book what's that the printed book uh the um the bleak reality um, well it began as a website pretty much like a like a, a blog and then because i make all these pictures to go you know as big as they need to go i really i print in three sizes which mm -hmm. biggest being like 40 50 um but for that book i wanted to make a book that was a 20 by 24 inch print so if you open them up, they are 20, 24 inch prints. Yeah. Um, and and it was kind of the biggest you can get on like an American press and yeah. also keep the price affordable at that size, staple bounds, mm -hmm. you know? So there's a lot of um, 
That's why. That's why it's that size, because I couldn't go any bigger with it being affordable, pretty much. One of the uh, unintended side effects or uh, benefits of it, I think, and this is just my assessment, my opinion, is that when we talk to um, artists that are making books, oftentimes they want to go big for the pure vanity of it, right? It's not, it's, it's, there's no other reason. But one of the, what's so important about the work in, in this piece and the size is that you cannot, you cannot read it. You cannot hold it far enough away where it's not in your face. So, so the importance of the scale, at least in my assessment was, or, you know, that um, the detail level here of these horrific places where young black men were killed on video, um, you can't escape it. Now, if you were to do this in a quarter page format or a half digest yeah. size, it would have not lost all meaning, but certainly wouldn't have the impact. So yeah, it's hard to make small books, actually. I mean, we we focus a lot in the press about like our press focuses on small books. We make big books, but our main size is pretty much seven by nine inches vertical for most of the books we produce. And that's because of a lot of reasons. But um, but yeah, the, that, that project probably doesn't work at seven by nine inches vertical, which yeah. means that like the picture would be six inches wide or something like that. So right, right, you can't yeah. really just get lost in all that detail because it's sharp. I mean, they printed that thing so sharp that you can see like all the writing everywhere in it, which um, which was kind of the goal. And all the pictures are actually taken at the same time as the people died. Uh, so like that's one piece of it as well. Uh, Thank you. But yeah, of course. Thank, thanks for showing it to your people. That's awesome. Uh, cool. So then I just made a string of books. I mean, I made over the course of the years, I made four books with a dude named Greg Greg Evans, who makes a series of books named A Setting Sun. All pretty cool and all about like kind of how humans have pretty much left this world. Uh, um, damaged and kind of uh, dirty. Uh, we're doing a fifth book now, which will come out at the beginning of next year. Uh, work with a dude named uh, Ruben Wu, uh, who's now very famous. Um, he like stays working for Apple and all these people. But then he was kind of growing this uh, brand and figuring out how to, I mean, try to be an artist at this point. I think he's turned into more of a commercial photographer than than an art photographer. But at this point, there was like this mix of where he was doing things that I think no one else was really doing. So he he uses a drone with a light on it to light these scenes in the desert at night. And I thought that, that was pretty special because I'd never seen anybody do it in this way or pick the locations that he was choosing. So we made this really big book of his work and we're like, we'll make it big and hopefully it sells enough. He had, a, I think, 75,000 uh, followers on Instagram when that actually matter, when people actually followed you like and were interact like like with like with you. Um, and it's changed. Instagram has changed, of course. But um. Yeah, we made enough to make, I mean, this book probably cost us like 16 or 17,000 then. Um, and we made enough in I think two and a half days to print this book, which was kind of amazing. I should have made more books, but um, whatever, sold out well. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, we made a book with Raina Young about uh, a year long relationship ending. Uh, her, her boyfriend wanted to become uh, a woman. So she photographed them breaking up for a year. So this is that book. Uh, Ruben Natal San Miguel has been photographing Harlem at this point for about 20 years. So we made a nice little book of his. We made a group show in a book named On Death, which is 45 photographers photographing their ideas of death. Um, we're now making a second kind of run of this book called Of COVID, which has about, I think, 70 or 58 photographers the format will be very similar. It'll be a bigger book this time because I now know that I can make a slightly bigger book and it will cost exactly the same. I've learned more about publishing since I made these things. Um, and then COVID happens. So like COVID happens and then we uh, are selling from home, trying to figure out, um, I'm on the Cape. So you can see that I'm on a beach taking pictures because I'm super bored in the house. Um, should have got one of those scooters. I should have got one of those, like not like just the base, like no handhold, just like a wheel under your feet anyway i'm just kidding because those things are like murder machines uh but uh anyhow so went up to the cape and photograph and just was trying to sell books from from the middle of covid all of my day jobs were gone of course and the only way for me to make any kind of income was for like selling books so i tried very hard and this was kind of the only big book that was selling at that point because it was the only big book we had but you know, we sold, I mean, there was a lot of stuff happening when this book was out, like the George Floyd protest had maybe just kind of, he died, but the protest didn't get big until kind of the middle of this book being out already. And we only made 300 copies of the book, so they sold quickly. Um, 
out of order, we made we make this series of books named Lost, which focus on city-based projects from different photographers. So this was Lost One. This was 10 photographers photographing 10 cities around the world. We did a, a set of 20 photographers. This was like COVID year, actually, 2019. 20 photographers photographing 20 places around the world. And yeah, that was a good series. And then uh, we did, uh, this is from a woman named Aline Smithson. We sold out of her book first because she's awesome. Uh, we did Lost Three during COVID at the same time as um, that Enough book I just showed you. And we did eight photographers photographing eight places over the period of time. So New York and Afghanistan are two books that are set set in the 60s and 70s pretty much. And the rest are kind of current time. We also made a book named uh, Colonial Colonial Echo with Rochelle Mosman Solano, who photographs her mother. This is her and her mother, actually, but photographs her mother in these like very domesticated scenes. Um this book actually becomes popular, more popular with age, actually. When we first made it, no one bought it. And now people buy it. I think things have changed and people actually give a shit. So that was nice. Um, about a year into COVID, we made a book named Electronic Landscapes with photographers Isaac Diggs and Edward Hillel. How much time have I been talking so far? Um, we're at 535. Okay. You're doing great, Chris. Keep going. There's so much shit to show. Um <laughs> Yeah, so we made this really big. This is like 11 and a half by 13 and a half inches, this book. And it's pretty much uh, set into four parts. The first part of this book is the pretty much Detroit started techno music. The people like the Detroiters started techno. And it then moved around the world to like places like Berlin and everywhere else. Um, so they went on a like uh, these two dudes for about seven or eight years, photographed everything they could about this scene. So they photographed all the places where people were listening to music outside they photographed the artists in their studios, um, the artists and their studios, and of course the inside places where people were listening to music at night. And then the back of it is a humongous database of information about like all of the stuff you see within the book and, and ex like a bunch more photographs of everything. So that was, that's an intense project. That was pretty intensive um, and designed really well. This is all COVID books, actually. I think everything now is a COVID book, actually. Um, this is a book by a dude named Marshall Shuttle. Um, named uh, Morning Star. This die cut star here goes through two pages in the book. Anyway, anyway, you, if you look at my website, you can see every time a book, this hasn't sold out yet, but every book that sells out, I try to put the full book on the website so you can see every page, every picture, full screen so that you can actually experience it without having it. Because that's the problem with books. Once you Once they're gone, you can't really access it. So I try to I'm going to try to make it so that everything is accessible for everyone to see research wise and everything else. Um, Marshall was photographing in Vegas with an 810 view camera. And I thought that that was a first, like a night, like what a nightmare. I mean, like, but he's really good at what he does. And he, he pretty much consistently makes the best pictures I've ever seen. Um, so I always kind of hire him when I'm going on the road so that I can like look and see what he's doing. Anyway. Um, during COVID, I also started a, a, a second publishing company named Monolith, which is devoted to or focusing on people of color in the arts, not only photography. The first book we made was uh, Remember the South by a dude named Frank Francis. Um, and he was dealing with, you know, he's from the Carolinas and he, he has a Southern upbringing and it shows in these still lifes that he's made in this book. So, of course, that's the Confederate flag in cotton. Um, the left side is you know, Kool-Aid pretty much. I mean, growing up there with no money, you're drinking Kool-Aid. So he starts to play around with the Kool-Aid and making it something different. Um, we did a book with a dude named Giancarlo Montez Santangelo, who just just had showed at the Whitney Biennial. And he went to my alma mater. So uh, many years after me, um, maybe, I think actually he was my intern at the Guggenheim at some point too. At the Guggenheim, I got to pick interns. So I always pick one from my college for 11 years straight. Um, so I always work with photographers that I still am familiar with now. And he's pretty great. I mean, he's his book is pretty awesome. If you guys know who Paul Sequia Mbappe, I don't know how to say his name, actually, but he's the guy on the left and the photographer is the one on the right. So they work together often. I also work with a woman named Lauren, Lauren Noel Oliver, who is photographed. This is called Temple of the Self. And it's pictures of her, her sister and her then boyfriend, um, She's just a good photographer. So I wanted to make a book with her. She also went to Purchase College. We made a book with a woman named Rajni Pereira from Toronto, a Sri Lankan uh, Canadian artist 
And this was kind of like that um, bleak reality book, oversized 11 by 14 inches actually, and paintings. And she makes these kind of um, ultra futuristic uh, paintings of what she feels like the future will be. Um, recently, we made a book with a dude named uh, Alex Christopher Williams called Black Like Paul. And this kind of deals with, uh, Alex um, is a, a very white passing black man, pretty much. And um, and he, he's been dealing with a lot of issues his whole life. And this is kind of the culmination of those issues in photography for him. Work with a woman named Nidia Blas, who now has a new book with Fallline, Fallline Press. And this book is called Revival. And it's, it's pretty much all young black women um, and magic, pretty much. Uh, last year, we made a book with uh, Marie Smith, a London-based uh, photographer um, and poet named, and this book is called The Fog Has Lifted. So what we decided to do with this book is we begin it all black and there's a lot of text that goes along. Pretty much this book is about coming through a, a COVID depression and it starts with the pain and it starts to get lighter and lighter and lighter as the book goes on. Uh, so by the end, it's like half white trying to get out of this darkness. I work with a really good designer now, so I don't have to do all the design work myself. Most of my books have been my own. Like, I think we've made almost 100 books and I've designed about 90 of them. And now, now I'm working with a designer, so he'll do everything else, hopefully for inexpensive prices. But this year we made a book named Stranger Fruit with a photographer named John Henry. Um, and it came out really well, really well. We did a lot of cool things. The designer really did work on this book. Um, and this is pretty much a series of work that you've probably seen because it's been so popular in, in the world in the last three or four years. And it's pretty much uh, Pietas, Black women holding their play dead Black sons all across America. I think about 30 states or so. Um, yeah, so pretty strong project. And the project that I have this year that I also produced, that we, we have a... We've not done too many books this year, but I made this book named Privileged Mediocrity, which is work from, um, I got a job working with National Geographic photographing um, what I thought was landscapes of the Confederate monuments in the South. Um, and it turned into just George Floyd protest photography for the first job. And then I went back, the, since they liked that work that I did for them and um they hired me for a month to photograph every Confederate monument and school and everything named after a racist in the South that I could find. So I went for 24 days to photograph everything I could find and came back with, a, I think, a few hundred Confederate monuments. There's a lot. There's a lot of them. I probably photographed 10% of all of them. Um, there's a lot. A lot of them are gone now, which is cool. Not a lot. Not a lot are gone. I would say that, like, if there's still two, if there was 2,000, I think 2,000 still exists, but maybe 100 of 100 have vanished. Um, the small towns will probably never lose them, but I'm just going to roll through my book, um, page by page. The first part of this book is kind of, a American Chris, history. Uh, okay. Yeah. Never mind. Sorry. We've, 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 sorry. I thought that your, um, thing was stuck because we were looking at the sunset sort of image for a long time. Yeah, no, not stuck. Okay. Um, but yeah, this is every page of the, this book that I just made. Um, the first part of this book is about 10 years of work photographing kind of American bullshit racism in the landscape, um, uh, gentrification, climate change issues, infrastructure problems, and um, and the people stuck within it, right? So um, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of the first part of the book that kind of starts with American history. I mean, it, it, the beginning of this book is pretty much American history um, and how, yeah, yeah. Um, this is an old slave market in, in uh, Charleston. Um, the largest Confederate monument outside of Atlanta, which is so big. This is actually bigger than Mount Rushmore, actually. So if you're ever in Atlanta, go check it out. Um, the arm of Stonewall Jackson, because they buried his arm, because he got it cut off from, well, actually, Stonewall Jackson died from friendly fire, um, uh, but he got shot in friendly fire. They tried to amputate his arm, and he still died. So I photographed where his arm was on government property, of course, and then photographed where he was buried too at the end of this book. So it kind of starts here. And yeah, people stuck within the problems. Um, yeah, so I won't explain all this because it's just a lot of shit to look at, but um, this is the book. I've co-published it with a, a press named Hache Kantz, who runs, who runs their press out of Germany. We made 800, 800 total copies of the book and I have 400 and they have 400. So um, 
we we share the we share the we share the share it all. Um, I'm going to be in Paris. If everybody's going to be in Paris for Paris Photo, I'll be signing books on the Saturday. Um, yeah. So yeah, this is my American Problems book. <laughs> and now I think I'll just keep making American Problems books for forever because I can see them. I I, I have the vision for them. They, they're everywhere. Um, so yeah, this first part of the book kind of is now this is kind of the gentrification part and like kind of the oversaturation of well, wealth and then the loss of wealth and all the issues within it. Yeah, my mom on the right side. Hawaii. Hawaii is a problem. Hawaii is a big problem. Um, and then we get to a part of this book named The Southern Horror. Um, and this this book, are, well, I was written by a dude named James Edward. Oh, actually, that's, that's not right. John Edward Mason, sorry. Um, and he did quite an amazing piece of writing for me. And I I hope that everybody can read it at some point. Um, and then, so this is a series of like 200, pretty much 200 Confederate things or 200 pieces of racism in the landscape. And it's by state. Like you can see site of auction block here. There was like an auction block right where these flowers were. I didn't get, I actually mistakenly just took, I took this picture and this picture is like, this is like 5% of the picture. It's a huge picture and it sucks. But then I was looking many months later after I even pushed all the stuff to Nat Geo and I was like, oh shit, why didn't I cross the street to actually, anyway. Um, yeah, it was a busy shoot. Um, so we went all around Virginia photographing. Of course, my designer does all the good work. Um, and we have pretty much a story or a little piece of information about everywhere that we went because it acts as a kind of history of these places because I don't think anyone else actually has photographed as many Confederate monuments as I have in this country. Uh, probably not. I, if you if you know anybody else who's photographed Confederate monuments, please let me. Um, I saw some fun things like this. Is I'll I'll give you twenty seconds to read this um, because it's quite fun. This was in Augusta, Georgia, or North Augusta, which I think is actually still South Carolina because there's water in between. But Augusta is pretty much one of the poorest places I've ever seen in my life. I mean, the downtown, well, it's all it's all pretty de uh, desperate. You know? um, it's where James Brown is from. So they have like a nice James Brown monument two blocks away from one of the largest Confederate monuments I've ever seen in my life. Um, yeah. Yeah, where is this? Carolinas? Yeah, both Carolinas. Mostly South Carolina because at this point, North Carolina had already gotten rid of many of them. I mean, this one was fun. This one was in the middle of nowhere and I felt like I was going to get shot. But like, this is like, there was a few of these places where my driver, or not a few, but most of these places, my drive, like the person who was actually with me driving the car would stay in the car with it running because there was definitely some places where it felt like, uh, it felt pretty bad. Um, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia. We did this part. Uh, we were there for a few, a bunch of days, but most of the Confederate monuments are in the cities. So we just hit the cities. Um, Oh man, this one here, this one here was the scariest because this was in the middle of nowhere and we stopped the car and immediately people started walking towards us with like angry looks. And I was like, okay, it's on the old Dixie highway. Let's take the picture and get the hell out of here. So it was like the fastest picture I've ever taken in my life. Um, yeah. So this book is pretty, uh, there's a lot of shit going on in this book actually. So this, this is kind of like the history, history lesson part. I'm from Alabama. So I really focused on Montgomery. I shouldn't say I'm from Alabama. My family, half of my family is from Alabama. So I've been there many times and didn't really kind of realize how much terrible stuff has happened there. Um, of Well, I know how much terrible stuff's happened there, but not like the landscapes that still exist. Like all the schools, like every four schools in Montgomery, Alabama were named after Confederates until like last year. And my cousins went to those schools. They're like, there was a they're like, there's schools that weren't named after them, but we were pushed to these schools, even though they were farther away kind of shit. So there's a lot of stuff happening down there. I remember um, my wife and I went down for a wedding and, uh, oh, what happened? My wife and I went down here for a wedding and we passed this the first White House of the Confederacy, which is directly across the street from the Capitol. Um, and we walked near it and then there's a car, there's a big white pickup truck that rolls by with like... Um, the biggest Confederate flag I've ever seen on a pickup truck at that point and just rolls by, doesn't stop. And I was like, well, if they come back, we got to start walking the opposite direction. Two minutes later, rolls back around and then we we got out of there. Anyhow, um, 
Yeah. Alabama's fun. I want to go, I have to go back and photograph a little bit more. And it ends this, this project, this middle piece of the book ends with uh, a John Brown, uh, a John Brown monument in Harper's Ferry, which is kind of the kind of opposite of the Confederate monuments. The bottom left here, I don't think it, I didn't leave it in this picture, but the bottom left is, well, so his monuments here on this hill and on the street level, if you've ever been there, and if you ever go back, you should check this out because it's really West Virginia, or is that West Virginia? Sorry, I got to show you this because it's funny. So if you're ever there, oh, this is cool too. This is one of my favorite pictures ever. I love it. It's so stupid. Um, this here is the Hayward Shepherd Monument. He's actually the first person that died in the John Brown raids, and it's kind of John Brown's fault that he died, but um, United Daughters of the Confederacy kind of took his, his plight and like kind of made it into their own like john brown's terrible because he got a black person killed anyway so that's fun if you're ever down in in uh where sharp uh, west virginia if you're ever in west virginia go check out these things um so the the last part of this book is called latency and it's pretty much the idea of time catching up with the problem mm -hmm. right so we go through, again, American history and the issues like this is a Columbus statue that um, I missed getting thrown into a lake in Richmond, Virginia, a few weeks before I got there. But they left this beautiful thing for me to photograph. Um, and then I went around like pretty much on the same two trips as the as all the pictures you just or at least that middle section. I went around photographing these actual scenes of protest. This is a United Daughters of the Confederacy with love written down on the floor. Uh <laughs> with twigs so hilarious um this is outside of charleston charleston's a city in the background here and this is like an island where i think uh second most slaves um came in off boats and straight into charleston to be sold on auction blocks and now it's pretty much a community of people that drive their golf carts around the streets living and having a great time um yeah so i won't explain too much of these because they're kind of self-explanatory these photographs <laughs> um this one this is kind of where of course this is where the um selma marches started on the El edmund Pet not started but kind of came over the edmund pettus bridge pretty much you go over this bridge and you then take a 45 minute straight road to montgomery alabama from selma where this is and when i was down there oh well one the whole road is cotton so if you're driving on that road you're pretty much passing the cotton that was like pretty much picked by my great-grandfather and or great great grandfather, um, and my uncle, who I visited during this trip, was like, "Oh man, I remember being on one of those march, those protest, uh, the march, that march." And I was like, "You were there? That's kind of insane, man! Like, why didn't you tell anyone that you were like there?" She was, he was like, "Yeah, my mom drove us there, and then we walked back for the forty-five miles or whatever that day." And I was like, "You guys just like, in, like you were a child, seven years old, running like walking forty-five miles back to." So the, it was a, that's, that's some true shit, man. I mean, it was great that I heard that story from him then because two, I think one month later he died from COVID. So that was like good and really sad at the same time. Um, Richmond. So the thing about this book is the pages change size. I can show it to you in book form, but like uh, what you, you can see, if you look at the white border, you can see it changes. So these wide pages are shorter than the others so that you can see pieces of other pages through it so if you keep looking at the left side the next page is it gone so left right is a before and after right same scene but i was luckily there the day after the, like i was there the day they were cleaning off this monument because the, there was a woman power washing it for the city and then the next day they pulled it off and like they removed the whole statue um, and that happens a few times during this like uh of course where was it um all the stuff is gone now which is I'm glad, but like this guy on the what? This was here. Where is that? My God, never mind. Uh, it's too complicated. This statue here. These three photographs of this awesome Joker-looking man who is a, I call the Sea Confederate. On the left side, that's what it ended up being, and now it's just completely gone. And later on, I started photographing like Indianapolis, which is, there's some problems. There's some problems in Indianapolis. Uh, this one's in Tuskegee, Alabama. Um, the mayor actually covered that up. They took off the blue tarp soon after. I was like happy at this point because it was like 20 to, 
maybe a little bit more than halfway through that long trip. And I was like, oh, one of them is covered. Thank God. But um, they took off that thing. And then the, the, the mayor tried to cut off it at the base. So it would fall, but he only cut it off an arm. And then they were mad at him so that they, they redid it and renovated the whole sculpture so that it still stands and is better than it was before. So that's Tuskegee, Alabama for you. Um, outside of DC, they were just changing the name of John Lewis High School. I really hope they move the Robert E. Lee name from under it at this point. It's a lot of stuff, but you can see like where it was, like this is Atlanta and this is where one of the Confederate monuments was. I was unlucky enough not to see it, but I got that one. I like that picture. Um, little pop of orange, very nice. Um, yeah, so of course, before and after again. And all the schools, all the beautiful schools. We're at 5.55, just so you know. Yeah, I'll, it's over soon. Um, <laughs> this school is actually random. I used to, I was on the road so much that I would find Confederate monuments that weren't in like a list or a register at all. Like they were just kind of there. So there's a lot out there. This I think is a before and after as well. Yeah. Yeah, that was a fun one. It was a fun time. I mean, I thought I was going to die because COVID was still happening and, uh, you know, we didn't have a vaccine yet. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just do the work and see what happens. But I think the most popular photograph in this series was uh, from this kind of series of work where it was this George Floyd monument. Um, and, you know, a projectionist was projecting on all the sculptures down there. And this night he was doing this. I mean, he didn't do this every night. Um, he probably never did it again, actually, at like this specific um, series of uh, series. So I had to ask him to slow it down because every one of these was happening in like a quarter of a second. And I'm on a tripod with a medium format digital camera and I was not getting it. So I was like, yo, dude, you got to slow this down. And he kind of slowed it down. But then I realized I just had to shoot it like ISO 1600 and at a, like a quarter of a second and get it like I've still you can see I've still made them pretty big I can make them like really quite big um so thank god for medium format digital cameras I'll say that much you can make like a 50 60 out of ISO 1600 L world has changed kind of ends with the this sculpture exists on the end of the block where all five of these like mirror monument mile sculptures were and this one's the one that stuck and it's in front of the Virginia, I forgot the name of the museum, Virginia Museum of Arts or whatever. And it's a Kahinde Wiley based on, um, based on bah, 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 this guy, J.B. Stewart or J.E.B. Stewart. So if you look at that one and then you go back to all the way here, it's the same kind of uh, horsey, horsey man whatever. I'm really kind of so over photographing monuments that like when I have to do it now for work, I, I get kind of mad. Um, and it, and again, it ends here again with me standing next to the Stonewall Jackson monument. Yeah. And his shrine where he died pretty much uh, a list of all the works unnumbered, just so you have to go back and actually find it yourself. And the last picture in this book is this amazing monument outside of nashville that was torn to pieces recently they tried to take it down but then it fell and it cracked into a thousand pieces which was like the best way for this thing to end uh and that is that i think that's all i got that was an hour i spoke for an hour you did that was yikes. amazing yikes <laughs> that was great um was it even recording it was. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So um, I would love to take some questions or not me, but Chris <laughs> will take some questions. So much talking. Oh, anything you want to hear about publishing or artwork or anything else? Before yeah, the I talk, we were, we were, uh, we were, Chris and I were also talking about um, NFTs and like what's been going on with that. Um, I don't know. You, most of you probably know that he's been very active in that in that world too. Indeed, yeah, it was it was a really great market, and I think that you know the economy is semi struggling right now. So, well, it's at least struggling for, well, it's struggling. So it's slower, but people are still selling, definitely. Yeah. Other questions? Well. Chris, I have a question. Um, so you you said you published, you've worked on probably close to 100 books, 70 to 100 books, something like that. 
Um, yeah. Over 90. Do you have, uh, in your mind, do you have a reason why the emergence of the photo book or books with photos in them um, has become so popular and so in demand? I mean, as a choice of medium for artists? <laughs> Those are two different things you just mentioned. So one is the demand part, and then there's the artists that want to make books. Mm -hmm. Yes, artists want to make books, but that does not mean that there is a demand for them, right? So um, you have to create your own demand. I mean, there's no place where you're saying, hey, I have my book now, go get it. It's not going to happen, right? right? Like you have to actually make your own sales, and then that's how you're going to grow the sales you make. But on the side of artists being able to make books, it's the, probably the cheapest way to get into someone's home, right? I mean, prints are expensive uh, and no one buys them, right? I mean, I have, I've sold maybe, I don't know, a few prints a year at over like a real cost, like, uh, but I can sell many books. And that's the thing. Like if somebody wants something and it costs the three beers in a bar, then maybe they'll buy it. But if it costs a thousand, they're never going to buy it. So that's why artists should be making books, because if you can make a, an inexpensive, even a pamphlet of a book, like you can make a good book for 20 bucks. If you can sell a hundred of them, I sell it like this. I say it like this. If you have a hundred people that will buy your book, if you don't have a hundred people that will buy your book, don't make a book. Like if you don't have a hundred personal people that you can sell your book to, it is very difficult to even consider making a book, right? Why would you do that? Like you're going to have to find clientele or, a, and why, and, a, and if a, it gets weird with publishers, because now a lot of publishers or maybe most publishers ask you for a ton of money to make books. Yeah. So you're already going to be in this kind of debt hole and you're never going to make money on that book. So some people get lucky and they do a lot of work to do that. But like, for me, I know that like I have limited support, so I have to make these books inexpensive so people can actually even think about buying them. Mm -hmm. Um, I realize that the first book you make is going to be the book that most people buy. And then every other book, um, is, people won't buy it. So that's kind of how it works. So you have to get new clientele every time you make a book, um, kind of, uh, so because I know that I now focus on museums, like for me to sell to my books and the books that we make for our artists to museums, collections, and libraries is way easier than trying to find a public to buy these books. Now the public helps because they're buying books as well, but if I can focus on, and the other thing is the artists care about the museums, right? Like you, your book being in someone's home, it just is there. It's great that they have it, but they're not going to do anything with it, right? Like if you own that, if you had that bleak reality in the background, you never show it to students, then what's the use to me, right? As the artist. So yeah. and hopefully the museums and the libraries will hopefully show it to someone, or at least it exists in their database. So some years down the road, it will be there. So we focus on selling to museums and libraries um, and you should too. Uh, and it, you know, it's easy enough to find curators and like, I actually don't even talk to curators. I talk to librarians like, because they're much easier to talk to than curators. Curators are like pompous and uh, librarians are actually like care. So like um, for me, it's like way easier for me to have a conversation with somebody that actually gives a shit than like somebody who's like, well, I didn't find it. So I don't think it's actually valid, you know? Um, Anyway, I talk real shit about curators. I hope there's not too many on the call. <laughs> um, but yeah, I focus on libraries, local libraries, big libraries, you know, like, and over the, t over the years, I mean, like the first books we made, I didn't sell shit. I mean, the first three books, I, I sold barely enough to make money off the, I mean, I didn't even make money on those books. Those are losses, but, um, but eventually the, people still buy them. I mean, li British library just picked up um, everything we've ever made, everything they could afford, they bought. I mean, even the books that were like not available that I still hold for libraries for quadruple the price they bought. Mm -hmm. But um, that's, I made some of those books in 2011 and they're buying them now. So that's kind of the beauty of publishing. And one more thing, I, I promise I'll be quick. Um, so we're in this strange realm now where we have artists doing um, Kickstarters and stuff to come up with 20 grand for their half of what they're gonna do with the publisher. That's pretty common model these days. Then Very you have, you know, and it's um, you can go to the museums because you've done seventy books and you're uh, you're the gatekeeper that librarians and museums trust, right? But for the average photographer or, or visual artist that's making a book, um, that's cough, trying to get their friends to kick in twenty thousand dollars, there's no real vetting of that book. So, do you have any advice for 
photographers that are maybe going to make their first photo book and go through that route um, to ways they can assess whether or not that's the good a good decision. If you can't sell a hundred, a book don't make it. If you if a hundred books at forty dollars is four thousand dollars. Most soft cover books can be made for four thousand dollars. Small small scale. Like if you're gonna make like a seven by nine inch vertical book with sixty four pages, project book, not like a, a retrospective or anything, but like a project based book that's like small and holdable. Design the hell out of it. Pay a few thousand. I mean, look what like realistically, if I didn't have a press and I didn't have any people, I would say like. It's going to cost me two grand to hire a decent designer. It's going to cost me four grand to make the book. It's going to cost me um, a thousand, five hundred to a thousand to actually ship it to people. So I'm I'm in the hole for like let's say eight grand. Um, if I have a hundred people buy my book at forty dollars, then that's four grand. If I have if I sell two prints at two hundred dollars, addition of ten, and I can sell out of twenty prints at two hundred dollars, that's another four grand. So now I've sold 120 books and made eight grand to buy all the books. I have 500, co well, let's say 300 copies of that, which means that now I can sell an additional 180 books to make full profit. That is the mindset that I would come into any book making. So as far as you like, yeah, no, I don't think it's like that. I think that the museums only buy what they want. They don't care. I mean, maybe they do care that I have some history in making the books, but I think that you can contact any librarian in the world and tell them that you exist and then you would be surprised by the result. Librarians have a budget that is never ending because you can't buy enough books. Like curators can't buy shit because prints cost a lot of money. Librarians have leftover money at the end of the year. Chris, did you, did you, um, when, when, when Jeff said 20 grand, did you say 30? Uh, at least 30 now. I mean, is it, is it that out. much now? Yeah, man. It's totally that. Like if you like this book before COVID, like if I made this book, it's like, I think it's, uh, this is nine and a half by 11 and a half inches. It has about 160, 140, 160 pages in it. Um, two different papers on the inside, a slip, uh, a slip case under is a nice little Confederate flag that's hidden. Um, this book cost me uh, $16,000 for 800 copies. Um, it cost me two thousand dollars to ship it from Europe, so it's eighteen thousand. Uh, Hache Kant's bought eight thousand, or sorry, four hundred for half. So they bought half the books and paid half, and they went to pick it up in a truck from Germany to Italy, where the book was made. So I don't take a loss on any of that. So they gave me eight grand. So it cost me ten grand to make four hundred of those. I charge a hundred dollars for the book be on purpose because I want a book that is three figures, right? It's not normal and people don't buy it that fast, but I also want it forever. I don't want them to sell out. I want them to be here for all the museums and libraries that come in the future. So I'm thinking about that as far as this book is concerned, because now I don't have, I have eight copies of my first books and I'm, I can't give them to anybody. I, I'm holding on unless somebody, unless the right person gets them. Um, what was your question though? I forgot your question. I am just talking now at this point. The amazing no. thing, one of the amazing things about Chris, I mean, he's amazing all the way around, but is, and I've talked to Chris enough that the way he just did the math is how he thinks, like his brain just works that way. Uh, you know, the way you were just explaining how with the books and the printing and the thing, like, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, oh, I know what I was saying. Um, thank you. I mean, it's, it's just, with one, running a press, there's no other way to do it. It's like, I, I don't want to lose money. I don't usually make that much money, but I definitely don't want to lose it at this point. So I have to figure out if the artist is willing to do the real work to kind of sell it. I think that when you're when you're making a book with another, okay, sorry, it was it pretty much cost eighteen to twenty thousand dollars to make my book, which means that if someone else was making it for me, like a, if I went to a press, they try to charge me thirty five grand for it because they want to get paid. They have a and usually they're coming with the designer and distribution a little bit. I don't have a distributor. I have my own designer that works on the cheap because he wants to do good projects versus all the crap projects he does elsewhere, right? Like I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say crap projects. He's He does good work. He does good work. Um, but yeah, it's gonna cost you 35 grand at this point to work with most uh, publishers. And that's crazy. I mean, that's like crazy. That's crazy. So I'll never be working with a publisher. I mean, I'd never work with a publisher that wanted money from me ever. I won't do it. But um, 
but that's because I know that I can make it myself. And even if less people eventually see it, um, I just don't care. So if you think a publisher, if you're going to pay somebody 40 grand, if you have the money for it and someone's going to distribute your book, publish it and do all the work for you, that's great. Now you're still going to have to do the work to try to get it to the right places. Cause the publisher is not going to get it to places that you want it to go. It's just going to go to places. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want my books to sit in bookstores. I rather they not be in any bookstores. I do sell to bookstores, but they buy them. Um, so are not, I mean, printed matter you give them cause they're a nonprofit and they're a little differently run, but most of the time I'm selling something that has sold to bookstores. So I'm not really losing too much money on the product. And I like to be in control of my product at all times because I make the money if I'm in control. Um, I don't know if any of that answers the question, but, but yeah, it costs a lot of money to make these books and you could do it yourself way cheaper, but you have to make sure that you can sell it. There's no distribution for um, self-published anything. So that's one thing to keep in, keep in mind. But I imagine if you put a thousand dollars in Instagram ads, you probably sell out your book too. So there's a lot of ways to think about it. I mean, there's a lot of maybes. It's all a bunch of maybes, right? I mean, if you want a book, try to design it, make it look good. Try to get a publisher. If you don't, then do it yourself and do it cheap. Hardcover books are, are you know, if they didn't exist, I'd be happy because then no artist would ask for it. I think that hardcover books are like, so far going out of style that it's not even funny like i mean it's just like we still do it sometimes but like and they look great but if i could make all the books seven by nine inches at whatever page count soft cover with different cool soft cover designs and stuff like i have a whole mind of crazy materials we could use for that like i saw this like like a uh, pastel foam paper that they make in japan and i'm like that would be awesome i don't even know what to use that for but i need to find a way like that's kind of how I think about it now. It's not going to be more expensive to do it. It's just going to be like, get the press in Italy to buy the Japanese paper. If they can get it imported, then I can get the book. And like, that's kind of how I figure it now. If you want a book, you can make a book for $2,000. That's all I'll say. I mean, like I just got a quote for a small, like a, like half letter size. One second, let me show you. Give me one second. These are small. These, they're both eight and a half inches tall. Um, the presses work on, you know, most press sheets, if this is interesting at all. A press sheet's probably 28 by 40 inches average. 28 by 40 inches is the size of a piece of paper that goes through a printing press. How many ups can you fit on that? Meaning, I make books at 6.8 inches instead of seven because they will fit on 28 by 40 inches correctly. 16 up, right? 16 pages up, 16 down, which means that a 48 page book uses one and a half sheets of printer paper. So if I then make 10 books at once, it uses six pieces of paper or something like that. And six pieces of paper times 300 at this size, if I made this seven by nine inches, eight by 10 inches instead, it would be double the cost. <laughs> So then instead of making eight, 10, you might as well make nine and a half by 11 inches. And if you're doing nine and a half and 11, you want it bigger, then you might as well not make a 10 by 13. You might as well make an 11 and a half by 13 and a half because that's then the biggest. So it's like all this stuff, you know, it's just pretty much math on a piece of paper, 28 by 40 inches, divide it up, leave some space around the edges and in the like quarter inch in the middle for white so they can cut it properly. And that's, you know, working with the press sheet. I mean, we made a book with uh, Amy Elkins, which is five by six and a half inches because that's a size smaller where you can fit 32 up instead of 16. And then you can get 64 pages on one piece of paper. Um, have I given you too much information? No, but I have so many more questions. You know, it's it's a, it's amazing. I just, um, like you, the depth of your knowledge is, is really fantastic. Um, and I, um, I mean, I feel like you could do, you probably don't want to, but I feel like you could do a workshop on that and help a lot of people, um, or put together a little, you know, I don't know how many secrets you want to give away, but put together, um, you know, uh, some sort of 
booklet of basic advice for people, um, which would be immensely helpful. So many people struggle with how to get a book out. And, um, you know, when, with so many of these presses that are asking for a lot of money, some of them that, you know, I think we all know are fairly, um, exploitative, uh, with artists. Um, so anyway, um, yeah. What I was going to say, yeah. What I was going to say is this is half letter size, right? So this is on a digital printer, um, different than the offset printer, like off digital offset and offset. Um, digital offset, you can make anywhere. You can make it in New York or Canada. I usually make digital offset books in Montreal because they're just cheaper that way. But I usually make offset books in Europe because offset in America is like triple the price of offset in Europe. I mean, really. If you're if I was making my book in America, it would be over 60 grand for that 18 grand for sure. For sure. And it would be different papers that you know, maybe I like, maybe I don't. European papers are available in Europe. American papers and are available here. Asian papers are available in Asia. They usually do not cross. You usually can't use a Japanese paper in Europe unless they have a very special deal with the press. You know, so that's another thing. Um, American books are really expensive. So don't make big ass books in America because you will you will be able to find cheaper. Oh, and another thing. Okay, cool. So those people that want 35,000, like let's call it daylight, for instance. I mean, at this point, people should know that they are pieces of shit and they should like not be able to exist the same way that they exist. And that can be recorded and put on YouTube because I think that like at some point they're robbing people. Like they make a lot of books. Most of them are not good. And they do it because they make 40, 30 grand off people every time they make a book. And it's not right because they make their books. I'm pretty sure in China where this book that cost me tw like, let's say 18, 20 grand in China would definitely cost like 10 grand. And then they'll still charge you 35,000 for that. So that is what you want to stay away from. I was trying to be a little bit more delicate with my language, but go ahead, but go ahead on Chris. Um, but you do, you have to be really careful uh, about, you know, who's out there and, 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 and their practices. Um, yeah, totally. Oh, the one other thing I keep forgetting five and a half by eight and a half inches digitally made in Canada. There's 80 pages in this book. Pretty cool. Soft touch uh, cover. This book probably cost me $10 a copy to make. Right. So you can make a hundred cost you a thousand dollars. Now, if you can sell them for $28 times a hundred, that's 2,800 and you only paid a thousand. So now we're talking about actual profit out of, you can, if you sell 30 of them, you made a profit. It's small, but you know, your friends don't care. Your friends are way more likely to buy an $18 book than a $40 book. I'll tell you that shit right now. I mean, like if you kept selling, if I'm, all of my books were $18, I, I would be sold out of everything, I bet. So yeah, keep it cheap until you need something to be enormous, you know? Make little things. Make like, I mean, realistic. What I really want to do is just make like, I don't know if it's actually, I don't know. I have ideas. I can't actually give you the ideas, but I definitely have some ideas. <laughs> thank you so much chris this has been so great um is that the so end of questions no. no well i i don't have time let's just do it let's just well, I'll, we can I'll we can go back. a little bit longer if people want to stay um is that okay with you chris do you need you to get questions, off i will answer you need them to go? we can okay them. what questions do you have sorry that was a weird question i didn't mean to ask it that way um jenna yeah okay so i operate on like a glacial pace relative to you. So excuse me if I'm slow. Um, in terms of, so you've been talking about profit and then you were, were talking about your full-time job. Is this, has this always in terms of profit that you're able to turn around? Like the, was there ever a point where that like middle full-time job shifted? You get what I'm saying? I quit my full-time job in 2018. Okay. That was um, good. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I, at that point, I probably already made about 60 or 70 books. Um, so I did most of the bookmaking while I had a job. Um, but my job was pretty, I mean, I was, I was photographing artwork for the Guggenheim and I, I wasn't doing much of it. Meaning like I worked five days a week, but I was really, you know, I really was only photographing when somebody could give me something to photograph. So I worked, I could have worked harder, but fuck them. So I didn't. Um, and I did a lot of my like, like publishing and getting like all that stuff ready at work. You know, like I was a part of the, like I had free time is what I figured. And um, that's how it started. 
And no, there was no, there's no profit. There's no profit in books. There's no real profit. I mean, a thousand dollars is not real profit. You know, like to me, at least that's gone. I mean, a thousand dollars. I mean, my kids like daycare costs $3,000 a month. My rent's $3,000 a month. Um, and I didn't eat yet. So it's like I, the profit on books, like being like $20, like at this point, I can probably average a sale a day. And that will put 20 bucks in my bank account, 30 bucks in my bank account every day. But hey, that's food. I don't care. That's food. Like every week I can pay for food on book sales. So great. I take it. So profit, I don't know if I see it in the way. Like I, I feel it just because I don't have to worry as much. That's what I was looking for you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect profit. I'd actually expect a loss on the first book unless you did it small. If you make a big first book, then you're going to spend a lot of money. Yeah, I was more trying to get a sense of definitely expecting loss at the get-go. I was more thinking like, at what point? Was, did you see a place where you were like, oh, this is getting in better shape? Or did it sort of stay in general in terms of loss and profit? At like I made 20 books at once. And those 20 bo small books at once were um, was a good deal because making a lot of books at once is cheaper than making them individually, right? So if I'm making a book like uh, uh, Kavana, like this book is the size of most of our small books, seven by nine, pretty much, and or exactly 6.8 by eight and a half inches to be specific. Um, I can make one of these and I made 400 copies of this. This is gonna cost me before COVID two grand, during COVID three grand, now four grand. Um, and if I make, before COVID, if I made 20 of these, it would cost me like 16 grand, four, 15, 16 grand plus shipping. $1,400 to ship. So about like 18 grand again to make 20 books. So then you're thinking if I can sell out of two people's books at $28 times 600 copies, I've pretty much paid for this project and 18 books are free money. You know what I'm saying? So then you can do whatever the hell you want. You can work with the artists you want to work with that don't have any name at all. You can, as long as you put like three or four people that actually can sell with 17 people that can't, then you can, you can build your own kind of, uh, you build your own stuff. And then the thing is like, because the books are awesome, even if people don't know them, they're like, oh shit, I want that. It's 20 bucks at an art fair. I'll, I'll buy it. I'll buy it. So that's kind of the first set that made an actual profit in my mind because they were selling a lot. And people were interested in the project as a whole because it was just something that no one else is doing, like city-based set of books. You know, like it's kind of, no one does it. It's surprising. It's shocking that actually no one does it. And now people do it more because I did it first. <laughs> but uh, I would say like multiple books at once is great. So again, you guys are on the call. If you're interested in books, I mean, talk to each other. Talk to each other, make your books at once, go on press together and then get them shipped at once. I mean, you guys live in, different places i presume so that's a little different i mean that's a little different uh i don't know how you do that but if you have cars and you want to drive three thousand miles to get your books that's fine too you know but um boat shipping is what we do boat shipping is pallets that come off the boat and then you get your books that cost about that used to cost 1400 now it costs about 2200 per pallet um and uh i don't know why i'm telling you all this are there other questions before we start? Lo we're, lo we're losing people. So uh, any other questions about, yes, looks like uh, Crystal, did you want to ask a question or are you just putting your hand to your face? Yeah, I have a question. Um, is there any kind of publisher or printers that you recommend for people starting out uh, that we should look into maybe? Um, publishers? There's a or lot like of printers, there. like people, if we wanted to print our own book. Do that shit in the inkjet. I mean, realistically, the first book you should make, Red River makes a paper that's really thin and double-sided and you can like make your own book to see what it looks like as a dummy, a real good looking dummy. Um, and uh, as far as publishers to, or presses, I use a press named Sill um in barcelona which you know if you really are interested then i can i'll send you the email for but still is in barcelona right now we're making a lot of books at abc in florence um florence yeah florence i gotta go to florence i mean so those are the two main people we make books at because they're they're good to me and they print well um 
Uh, I would say the only difference really is my my designer notices difference that I don't notice. But if we make a small book in Spain, this book will open this much, right? But if we made the same book in Italy, it would open that much. So that little difference is what my designer can see that I that you know um, I trust him for. So like those little pieces don't cost more. It's just a better press doing better work. You know, mm. color is the same, almost, almost, almost. Um, color is the same enough. And all those little pieces, like even a soft cover book can be different. So imagine a hardcover. Like imagine how you could fuck up your hardcover book with a press that doesn't know how to like do it properly. You can't really know this stuff unless you like get samples. So if you're interested in samples, just ask these guys to send you shit and they'll send it to you in the mail for free. They'll send you paper samples. Now the problem with paper samples in the, the publishing world is they're not printed on, they're just pieces of paper. So you can't really actually tell what is what it, the printed page looks like ever. So it's kind of it's kind of weird. You'd have to still know, you have to still anyway. You can talk to any press, ask them what books that they have produced. Go to a bookstore, find the books, look at the papers. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we should get to wrapping this up. If there's a last question, we can take that. Thanks for being here, y'all. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate you um, and um, and all of your vast knowledge. So thank you again. And let's talk about you doing a workshop or a handout or something. Yeah, pay me to talk about books. That sounds great. <laughs> right? <laughs> all right. Good night, everyone. Oh, before we go... Um, if you I just you can check out our website. We um we just scheduled um so the next um peek behind the curtain talk is Elizabeth Stone. Um we just scheduled the uh Sama Al Shahabi's artist talk. It's gonna be on November 15th. It's on Zoom. Um you can find that on our website. Um and um and I hope to see some of you there as well. Also, we have our annual fundraiser going on right now it closes on november november 2nd it's on our website called the toast um so check that out and I, again thank you all for being here and thank you chris thanks for having me thanks y'all see you chris. good night oh, everyone thanks. peace y'all peace chris good thank seeing you, you bro see you soon show me the work <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>